Well, hello, everybody. Greetings. This is your favorite speaker. It's me on the right in front of, I'm sure you all recognize the building, the New York Public Library on Fifth Avenue at 42nd Street. Well, our topic for today is related to Fifth Avenue because that was the empire of Mrs. Astor and her single-handed effort to create an aristocracy for New York and the United States. Simply Mrs. Astor, the queen of the Gilded Age. Well, our outline is on the left, the background. Why was Mrs. Astor so important? Because the United States did not have an aristocracy. We were, and I'm sure Mrs. Astor wouldn't agree with this, but we were a nation of refugees, of immigrants, millions of Irish, Germans, English, Scots, later Italians, Eastern Europeans, Jews, Orthodox Christians, everybody. And today, Chinese, Africans, Arabs, Mexicans flooding into the United States. So we didn't have an aristocracy. And she set about to create an American elite. Well, she not only created an elite, but Fifth Avenue became her utopia. The Knickerbocker old New York families clustered around her mansion on Fifth Avenue. A little bit about Mrs. Astor. <clears throat> how she responded to the barbarian invasions following the Civil War, all of these Irish and Germans and later Italians and Jews flooding into her city. And then the famous battle. You had to be accepted by Mrs. Astor, and if you weren't, you were a nobody, as the Vanderbilt family painfully realized. So let's get started on discovering the fascinating Mrs. Astor. Well, recently, Mrs. Astor has been in the news. Um, recently, I just watched The Gilded Age, the HBO series showing the battle between Mrs. Astor, and the upstart Vanderbilt family. Fascinating story, if you really want to watch it. Downton Abbey was also very much in the news, and this was a great series on the British upper class. Well, the two stories are very different. In fact, Downton Abbey is meticulously researched, even things on, such as where does this fork go on a table of the upper class? So you just didn't throw the silverware down and say, dig in. The British aristocrats had their way of doing things, many of their families going back a thousand years. Well, the Gilded Age in New York didn't have a thousand years, but Mrs. Astor was going to sift the wheat from the chaff and come up with a great American aristocracy. So we're still fascinated by the elite, by the rich, by the famous, by royal titles. Just recently with the crowning of King Charles and the death of the queen, um, I was fascinated because these are families which go back hundreds, if not a thousand years. And the United States didn't have that. And so that's where Mrs. Astor came into the picture. Well, the United States was clearly anti-aristocracy. In fact, Article 1, Section 9, Clause 8 of the American Constitution said that there will be no titles of nobility in the United States. There will never be a Marquis of Manhattan, a Baron of the Bronx, a Queen 
of queens. So this was forbidden. We were going to be a democracy where everybody was equal. Now, in England, you can have lords and ladies and princesses and duchesses, but even Mrs. Astor remained a simple Mrs. Astor. She could never be a duchess. She could never be a princess or a queen, no matter what she may have thought of herself. So the United States really was one of the few countries that didn't have an aristocracy. In France, in Belgium, in England, in Holland, in Germany, in Russia, in China, in Japan, Ethiopia, the countries of Africa all had their emperors and their kings and their royal families. But the United States did not. And so even if you could trace your ancestry back to, let's say, the late 1700s in America, as I can, but it's still, we're going to be Mr. and Mrs., and maybe doctor or professor, but no royal titles. Well, the Europeans were very proud of their royal families, whether it's the House of Habsburg, which ruled over Spain and Portugal, half of the Americas, as well as Germany and Austria and Belgium. They were a royal family. The Romanovs in Russia, going back to the 1600s. You had the British royal family, the royal family of other kingdoms in Europe, the German states, Scandinavia, Italian states. None of this existed in America. Poor Mrs. Astor remained until her dying day simply Mrs. Astor. Well, the European families traced their ancestry back and they had a history of castles and palaces. Well, even Mrs. Astor's mansion on Fifth Avenue paled in comparison to the great castles and chateaus and palaces of the great European families. Well, the United States had a problem. As I mentioned earlier, the Constitution said we will not have an aristocracy. Mr. President is how George Washington addressed himself. We did not trace our history back to kings of the Bible. Jesus Christ, the King of the New Testament, King David and Solomon of the Old Testament. The founding fathers said, we're going to have none of this God talk. It's going to be the Plato Republic. It's going to be the Roman Republic, where everybody is a Mr., a Mrs., or a Miss. That's why the buildings of Washington, D.C. were built in the Greek and Roman style. Here we see the Capitol building, where the Congress sits, Greek and Roman architecture. No kings of Old Testament, no Jesus Christ the King, but all of this stuff. We are going back to Greece and Rome. <clears throat> well, there was one exception, though. Mrs. Washington was not going to be Mrs. Washington. She said, you can be Mr. President, George, but I will have a title. I will be the first lady. She was addressed as Lady Washington. People would go up, they would curtsy, they would bow, they would kiss her hand. Well, of course, royal titles were forbidden by the Constitution. But still, George Washington said the First Lady, well, she can have her royal title, but it wouldn't be capitalized, although she did capitalize it as Lady Washington. Well, gradually, Lady Washington simply became the first lady. No longer a royal title, but just simply an address like we say the first husband, if we would ever have a woman president. But 
She was the only person who demanded a royal title and got away with it. But gradually it faded away. Well, New York, as we all know, was founded back in the 1600s, 1624, in fact. Uh, um, and it was a city of immigrants, even under the Dutch. There were not that many Dutch people here. There were Belgians and Germans and Danes and French Huguenots, African slaves, Native American Indians. Uh, there were the first Jews who came, Sephardic Jews from Spain and Holland. Uh, so it was sort of a dumping ground for refugees, for immigrants, very much like the United States is today. Nobody had royal titles. Even Peter Stuyvesant was simply Governor Stuyvesant. And there you see his rather modest house in Lower Manhattan in the middle. And on the right, you see a map of New Amsterdam with Fort Amsterdam with its cannons to protect it. You see Broadway, Kerveg going to the right and to the left, the big street. And you see the wall going from the north, top to the bottom of Manhattan. That's today Wall Street. So New Amsterdam began as just a rather strange little settlement, a couple thousand people. No princes, no dukes, no royalty, just as it is today, a dumping ground for refugees. But still, Peter Stuyvesant had a certain fame. In fact, when the English marched in, or I should say sailed into New York Harbor and took over the city, um, he went back to Holland, almost was hung as a criminal, but then managed to get back to New York and lived his last years in New York at the Bowery. Here you see the church, St. Mark's in the Bowery. He is buried underneath that church in the crypt. Above there you see the blue stone, and that is his tombstone. In front of it is a big slab of stone that you lift up, and the stairs go down into the basement where he is buried. In fact, he was much beloved by New Yorkers. And in fact, there is the story that his ghost emerges every year and he walks around his city, no longer New Amsterdam, but New York. He roams around and checks his city. That is the ghost of Peter Stuyvesant. Well, Many of the Dutch who came are names which we still recognize today. For example, the Schermerhorn family. You see J. Jacob Janssen Schermerhorn I, 1622, the descendants of the Schermerhorns. And we see at the bottom, Carolyn, Mrs. Astor, was on one side of her family, a good old Dutch family going back to the very foundation of New Amsterdam. And on the right, you see a seal of New York, incorporated 1625, founded 1624. And you see a Dutch sailor on the left and an Indian on the right with a Dutch windmill, two beavers, since the beaver skin was the most important export of the colony. And two barrels, no, they're not Dutch beer, they are um, wheat. New York was very good at growing corn and grain, ground it into flour, and it was a major export. So Carolyn, Shemmerhorn, Webster, Astor, was about as aristocratic as you can get in New York. Even though she didn't have a title, she was still Mrs., but very proud of her Dutch ancestry. Well, the Dutch were very important in the city, but yet there were other Dutch families and English families and Scottish families and German families who gradually found their way to 
New Amsterdam, and later New York. And these are about as close as New York is going to get to an aristocracy. Many of the names we still recognize today, Livingston, Beekman, Van Cortland, Phillips, Van Resslauer, Tyler, De Priester, Gage, Jay, Delancey. Well, the Germans also started coming over very early on, and that's where we get Johann Jakob Astor, who came to New York, got in the beaver trade. Yeah, John Jacob Astor, son, Americanized his name. Then there was William Backhouse Astor Sr., William Backhouse Astor Jr., and so Mrs. Astor was Astor by marriage, but she had good Dutch and English heritage going back to the colonial period. She was related to the old family, such as John Livingston of the famous Livingston families. Now, these old families, like the Astors and the uh, Schuylers and the uh, other old families, were very proud that they were the founding fathers of New York City and of the United States. John Jacob Astor, the father of the Astor clan, was born in the town of Waldorf in Germany, came to the United States in 1784, shortly after the end of the American Revolution. And when he died in 1844, he was the richest man in America. The book on the right, America's first multi-millionaire. So very much this vision of coming to America and making it great. We saw the same thing with the Trump family. German immigrants who came over, made it big. And just like the Astor family, the Trumps love putting their name on every building they can find to celebrate their success in America. Rising from a nobody, John Jacob Astor's father was a butcher, and John Jacob ended up the richest man in America. So these were the origins of an American aristocracy, an American upper class. Well, the Astors were very proud of their success. They built the Astor Place Opera which we see at Opera Astor Place in Lower Manhattan. He made his fortune with the beaver trade. Look at the top hat that the men wore made of beaver skin. Beaver skin was very expensive because it was naturally waterproof. Astor Place had its row of apartment buildings with the Greek colonnades, as you see in the picture on the right. And there's even Astor Place subway station with good old Mr. Beaver there gnawing at a tree. So the Astors had a lot to be proud of, a lot of accomplishments. Well, gradually, a group of the old families began to cluster around a new square that was opening up in the early 1800s, and that is what we call Washington Square. Today, NYU is there. Picture on the right, you see 1624. That was the church on Washington Square. It was a Presbyterian church. It's no longer there. Uh, today, there are buildings of NYU, but that was the Church of NYU, which was founded in 1831. Well, the Dutch clustered among their other good quality families. They were Calvinists, meaning followers of John Calvin of Switzerland. They didn't drink, they didn't dance, they didn't swear. They went to church all day on Sunday. Very good, solid Christians. Well, the followers of Calvin were the Dutch Reformed, Scottish Presbyterian, French Huguenots, English Puritans, and German Reformed Christians like the Astor family. 
they started gathering together, these old families, in and around Washington Square. It became sort of their little utopia where only good quality people were welcome, which meant no Jews, no Catholics, no Italians, no Hispanics, only good quality Protestant families. Well, this was the world of Mrs. Astor. Well, we think of Mrs. Astor as a rather dour tyrant, but on the right, you see a picture of young Mrs. Astor, a very beautiful, attractive, well-bred uh, young woman, good quality on both sides. Well, gradually, these old families filled up Washington Square and they started building mansions along Fifth Avenue. So Washington Square and Fifth Avenue became sort of the kingdom of the New York elite. The picture on the left shows Fifth Avenue with Central Park on the left. And that was Mrs. Astor's mansion where she lived, raised her children, entertained, and really presided over this new emerging aristocratic class. She associated with good quality people. Here we see Helen Van Cortland White Shemmerhorn. They were very proud of their names. Of course, they were still misses. There were no duchesses or princesses, but they let you know that the Van Cortlands were their ancestors. The Shermerhorns were their ancestors. The White family were their ancestors. And they clustered. And here again, you see the colonnade row of apartments for the wealthy as it looked in the 1830s. Only a small section of that remains. But you can see how stately these people took their lives. <clears throat> Carolyn Webster Shemmerhorn, born 1830, ended up marrying William Backhouse Astor Jr. They got married in 1853, and they ended up having five children. And there you see the classic portrait of Mrs. Astor, and a very um, dour, severe, looking woman. Her husband's not very welcoming either. Can't really see him bouncing little kids on his knee, but still they were the New York aristocratic elite. And they lived in style. Now, of course, most of these new people who were getting rich had very little um, cultural background. So they basically went to France and to a less extent to England to see how the wealthy in Europe lived. They would hire architects. They would hire agents to go around scouring for paintings. They would have great painters come over and paint their ancestors, sort of uh, trying to show that even Americans had illustrious ancestors, sort of forgetting that John Jacob Astor's father was a butcher. Gradually, he was almost transformed into a Renaissance prince. But you see the paintings on the walls, beautiful furniture. But these new people had to learn how to live. They had to learn how to speak French or German. They had to learn how to dress well, how to eat well, how to entertain well. And they copied the aristocratic families of Europe. Well, it was not just money that counted. You had to have good pedigree going back as long as you could. And you had to go to the right churches. No synagogues and Catholic churches on Fifth Avenue. We had First Presbyterian, founded in 1716. Marble Collegiate traces its heritage back to the very first St. Nicholas Church 
Dutch church in the fort. So gradually this Washington Square area and then creeping up Fifth Avenue was the reserve of the wealthy with their mansions, with their churches, with their clubs, and everything associated with an ethnic neighborhood. But in this case, of the super wealthy. Here again, we see Mrs. Astor admiring her mansion, which was 1896. It's no longer there. Today, it's all the whole Fifth Avenue is covered with skyscrapers. But every once in a while, you see a mansion that is still squeezed between two skyscrapers. A couple of them are still there, but most of them have been demolished. She learned how to entertain, lavish entertainment, costume balls, magnificent hats and feathers and jewelry, magnificent meals and music. Once again, copying the way the aristocrats of Europe lived, entertained, dined, danced. Well, following the American Civil War, masses of new immigrants started flooding into the country. The Civil War put a halt to immigration, but following the Civil War, as you can see from the graph, the number of immigrants just grew by leaps and bounds. The Irish and the Germans had started coming over before the Civil War, but then following the Civil War, masses of Europeans. And then by the time Mrs. Astor was presiding over Fifth Avenue, you had large numbers of Jews from Eastern Europe, Southern Italian Catholics, and other miscellaneous people. Well, this only spurred Mrs. Astor more and more to barricade herself on Fifth Avenue and decide who was of good quality, and who was not. <clears throat> Many people became very wealthy during the Civil War. I mean, people like the um, Stuyvesant family, for example, uh, who had been simple Dutch farmers going way back to the colonial period, but of no consequence, suddenly they found themselves fabulously wealthy. Civil War, wars in general, are good for business. The only people that suffer are the poor soldiers who get killed, but nobody cares about them. If you're a Stuyvesant or an Astor or these old New York families, I mean, you made a fortune. The Brooklyn Naval Yard created an entire class of wealthy industrialists who built the ships for both the North and the South, First, ironclads were built in the famous Brooklyn Navy Yards. And of course, they gave jobs to the incoming Irish and Germans and later Italians. Well, this new class of Civil War millionaires was rather challenging for poor Mrs. Astor because she started seeing new families showing up almost as wealthy as her, and she had to decide, well, who was going to be part of this New York aristocracy and who was going to be excluded. For example, A.T. Stewart, an immigrant from Northern Ireland, came to New York, built his famous Iron Palace during the Civil War, huge department store, became fabulously wealthy. Brooks Brothers, maker of suits for men, nothing of importance, made a fortune during the Civil War. And in fact, when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, he was wearing a suit by Brooks Brothers. Well, of course, Mrs. Astor was appalled at these cheap Northern Irish stewards and these English Brooks family that suddenly became wealthy and thought they should have a little corner somewhere to build their mansion on Fifth Avenue. The bottom of the picture, you see the A.T. Stewart 
mansion on Fifth Avenue. I mean, not as big as Mrs. Astor's house, but still a family of substance. Totally snubbed by Mrs. Astor, these nouveau riches, these new people flaunting their money, almost as vulgar as Donald Trump. But yet she was going to preserve the purity of the New York City elite. The Lehman family, German Jews, migrated to the South, became one of the biggest slave-dealing clans in the pre-Civil War South, made a fortune in the slave trade. When slavery was overthrown, they migrated to New York and into all kinds of banking, a cotton exchange, and built one of the big builders of Temple Emmanuel on Fifth Avenue. This is the first Fifth Avenue Temple Emmanuel that you see, built with the ill-gotten gains of slaveries. But when you have that much money, then you can sort of sweep your notorious past under the rug and maybe become part of the New York elite. But of course, Mrs. Astor would have nothing to do with them being German Jews, being tarnished by the slave trade. But yet they were a factor to deal with in New York. Delmonico's made a fortune in restaurant, famous Delmonico's restaurant. They were Swiss Italians, Heinrich Steinweg. Henry Steinway migrated to New York, made pianos. But then, of course, during the Civil War, he was making cannons and bayonets. And both Delmonico and the Steinway clan emerged to prominence. William A. Clark built the gaudiest and ugliest mansion ever built in New York City on the left. He was the king of copper, making a fortune during the Civil War. Mansion on the right was built by my mother's cousin, Charles M. Schwab, German Catholics, who migrated to New York, made a fortune as president of the United States and Bethlehem Steel. There you see Cousin Charlie's face on Time magazine. But he was totally banned from Fifth Avenue because he was Catholic. So he had to build his mansion, the largest mansion ever built in New York City, up on Riverside Drive, because the racist Jews and Protestants of Fifth Avenue could not tolerate a Catholic amongst them. Madame Restel, another claimant to fame, made a fortune during the Civil War, providing prostitutes, abortions, marital aids for women, built her own Fifth Avenue mansion, but, of course, totally shunned by Mrs. Astor and the old family. So you see the famous book by Clifford Browder, The Wickedest Woman in New York. But these were the kinds of people who were threatening the old families, such as Mrs. Astor and her Fifth Avenue crowd. She had to do something. She had to preserve the purity of the New York emerging aristocracy. Lewis Comfort Tiffany, again, famous for luxury items, made a fortune catering to the wealthy, decorating their homes, stained glass windows, table service, furniture, carpets, made a fortune teaching American wealthy how to spend their money. Well, many people tried to elbow their way on to Fifth Avenue and the upper class. Augusta Schoenberg, a German-Jewish banker, came to New York 
and realized that the only way he was ever going to get any acceptance in New York upper class was to become a Protestant, change his name from Schoenberg to Belmont. And he ended up marrying into good quality families. But still, since he was of Jewish background, Mrs. Astor didn't think that he was quite up to her high standards. But still, the Belmont the family became famous for the horse races, building the earth transportation system, and was a very respectable family in the eyes of most people, but not Mrs. Astor. Well, of course, the Belmonts, like the Trumps, uh, plastered their name everywhere. The famous Belmont Stakes, the horse racing, um, uh, really became a major fixture of the New York upper class. So even people like the Belmonts were gradually moving up on the social register. Catholics and Jews made it a point of showing Mrs. Astor that Catholics and Jews belonged on Fifth Avenue. St. Patrick's Cathedral was built on Fifth Avenue. The first Fifth Avenue Temple Emmanuel built on Fifth Avenue as a sign that Catholics and Jews were making their way in New York and she was going to have to either accept them or they would destroy her little world. So this is called the Gilded Age. That is decades following the Civil War when all these new people were making a fortune, were building mansions on Fifth Avenue, and were eager to become part of the emerging New York City aristocracy. This is called the Gilded Age. Gilded means that you are gold on the outside, but don't ask what's under that thin layer of gold. This was a golden age for New York. As we saw earlier, the TV series, HBO series of the Gilded Age, elegance in dress and carriages. Edith Wharton wrote her famous book, The Age of Innocence. Uh, um, Mark Twain coined the term the Gilded Age. Uh, in his book of 1873. And so it was a golden age of the American upper class. Well, Mrs. Astor kept very strict control over who was considered part of the aristocracy and who was not. Families went to war. For example, the Vanderbilt family was eager to make its way in the city, going to live, fight, war against the Astor clan and against the other clan. So while the men were making war financially, the women were the ones who controlled access to society. So two men might be making business together, but it was the women who decided which families would intermarry, which children would associate with each other. So the women like Mrs. Astor ruled the mansion. They ruled who their children would marry, what schools they would go to, who they would associate with. So the war between the Mrs. Astor and the Vanderbilt clan was as vicious as the war for money between the old family Astors and the upstart family Vanderbilts. Cornelius Vanderbilt, famous Commodore, 
um, was from Staten Island, and his family had been in the United States since shortly after the, um, uh, uh, even during the Dutch period. The Commodore was born in 1794 after the American Revolution, and during the Civil War, he had become fabulously wealthy in shipping and then later in railroads. But they were low-class people from Staten Island. There you see this is the Vanderbilt farmhouse, not a Fifth Avenue mansion. They were simply farmers. Well, he became fabulously wealthy during the Civil War, but remained basically a meat and potatoes type farmer in spite of his phenomenal wealth. <clears throat> well, gradually, as his wealth increased and as his children began climbing the social ladder, they moved from Staten Island to first Washington Square and then began migrating up Fifth Avenue. The area between 51st and 59th Street along Fifth Avenue was called Vanderbilt Row because the Commodore bought all those blocks and built mansions for his many children. As soon as they got married, they would start producing their own children. As a wedding gift, they would be given a mansion. Well, of course, Mrs. Astor was horrified at these new vulgar people forcing their way onto her street. Well, the mansions got bigger and more and more elegant. On the right, you see the mansion uh, on 52nd Street. Once again, they were elbowing their way into the world that Mrs. Astor thought she controlled. Well, the Vanderbilts were fabulously wealthy. But as we saw with Mrs. Astor, no matter how much money you had in the United States, you were still Mrs. So Mrs. Vanderbilt and Mrs. Astor were simply Mrs. There were no dukes or duchesses. Well, the Vanderbilt clan decided that they were going to one-up on poor Mrs. Astor. So they sent Consuela Vanderbilt with a shipload of gold bars to Europe, saying, find a man who has a royal title, but no money. Marry him. Make yourself a Duchess, so you can come back and you can be Duchess Consuela Vanderbilt of the Marlborough family. You can have a royal title and you can look down at poor Mrs. Astor. So Consuela ended up going to England, married into the Spencer Churchill family. And uh, became a duchess. So these were the, this was the beginning of the American women who went to Europe looking for a husband where they would pay them to marry them. They would restore their family castle. And whether there was a love match or not, at least the Vanderbilts were now dukes and duchesses. Well, Consuela's Van, uh, Vanderbilt's marriage was at St. Thomas Episcopal Church on Fifth Avenue in 1870. See the picture of the church on the right? That was the old St. Thomas. The new St. Thomas is there after this one burned. But it was considered the most lavish wedding ever held in New York. <clears throat> Here we see Consuela Vanderbilt and her little boy, who would grow up to be Winston Churchill. And so this was another step 
in the rise of an American aristocracy. These women were called the dollar princesses. In fact, there are movies about them and all kinds of stories where mothers especially would force their daughter to Europe, scour around for some duke or, or prince or baron and get a royal title. In fact, many of these dollar princesses ended up going to Russia, where you could always become a grand duchess if you had enough money. Others went to Italy, to Spain, to even Turkey, where they would find an aristocrat with no money but a great title and end up marrying into royalty. Well, Mrs. Astor was having none of this. She was an American and she would be Mrs. Astor forever. She ruled over what she considered was the fabulous 400. Now, of course it was 399 because she was the 400th person, or she was probably number one. So, um, but she would decide who would be welcome into her mansion, who would be entertained, what marriage was appropriate. And she went so far as to decide what clothing was in fashion, what food was in fashion, what concert was in fashion. And ruled her empire of 400. Well, situation got bad in 1883 because on March 26, there was a magnificent ball being held by the Vanderbilt family in their mansion on Fifth Avenue. Well, Carolyn Aster was not invited to the ball. Well, Mrs. Aster was irate, saying, how come my daughter is not invited to the Vanderbilt ball? Well, Mrs. Aster and Mrs. Vanderbilt had not been properly introduced because Mrs. Aster would not welcome Vanderbilt's into her house. So Mrs. Astor was forced to cross the street to be greeted by Mrs. Vanderbilt. And uh, then her daughter would be invited to the grand ball. Now this episode is very wonderfully portrayed in the HBO series of the Gilded Age, showing the rivalry between the two women. So Mrs. Astor ruled over her 400. In fact, it was called Mrs. Astor's New York. Now, she was in cahoots with a guy named Ward McAllister, and he was the sextant at Grace Episcopal Church. And it is said that he had as much influence in deciding who was included in the 400 social register as did Mrs. Astor. But here again, Mrs. Astor was deciding who is in the in crowd and who is not in the in crowd. <clears throat> so Mrs. Astor, humiliation, when she was forced to call on Mrs. Vanderbilt so that her daughter could be invited to the grand ball being held in the Vanderbilt mansion. Well, the New York Social Register is dated from 1886. When, who was listed, and who was not listed became a major issue. 
In fact, there were all kinds of signs of who was in and who was out. What an interesting experience. Get the obituaries of New York Times and find a very important person and read how they are described. They're not saying how much money they had, but what they're saying are things like Mr. So-and-so was a member of, and they list the private clubs that he was a member of, that he was on the board of such and such a museum. His wife was a major donor to the ballet or something like that, that they were entertaining every summer at their house in the Hamptons or along the Gold Coast of Northern Long Island. And these were the signs of who was in and who was out. Of course, if you wanted to be anybody in the New York elite, you had to be a member of the Union Club, the mother of New York City clubs, described as the most thoroughly aristocratic private institution in the city. You do not fill out an application and ask to join the Union Club. You have to be invited and sponsored by members who go through your pedigree with a fine tooth comb to see whether you are worthy of joining these great clubs. The Knickerbocker Club, 1871. Here we see the old Knickerbocker Club still exists. And this was founded by another group of people um, where the Belmonts finally got admitted into good society. This is the current Knickerbocker Club on Fifth Avenue, just at the corner of Central Park and the Plaza Hotel. Here again, this is a private club that you are invited or you are not invited. The name Knickerbocker goes back to Washington Irving's book, The Knickerbocker History of New York of 1809 when he describes the old New York families as being the Knickerbocker families. Now, if you want an experience, walk up and down Fifth Avenue at night and look in the windows of these private clubs. You'll get the odor of chlorine coming from the sauna and the swimming pool and the gym in the basement. But in the other windows, you will see magnificent chandeliers, dancing, music, libraries, smoking rooms. Here again, a sign of who is in and who is out. Well, the Jews were excluded from the good quality clubs. So what did good, wealthy New York Jews do? They established their own club. And this was for German-speaking Jews only. None of these Yiddish Jews from Eastern Europe or Sephardic Jews or any of these low-class Jews. And even the name, the Harmony Club, the correct name is the Harmony Gesellschaft in German. On the left, you see the original Harmony Club, and on the right, you see the current entrance to the club. And this was a typical New York response. The Protestant clubs don't want Catholics and Jews. Well, the Catholics and Jews established their own personal clubs, and they exclude the people they don't like. Another sign of the growing aristocracy is the famous mansions along the Gold Coast, the North Shore of Long Island. Many of these mansions are still there today. The Roosevelt, Vanderbilt, Woolworth, Gould, Guggenheim, Kahn, Post Astor families. The Post Campus uh, uh, is today part of Long Island University where uh, they took over 
one of these large mansions and made it one of their university campuses. This was another sign of who was in and who was out, who had the mansion, who was invited to gala balls at the mansions and who was not. The Astor family is still among us, uh, old families. Um, they, they still go to the elite schools. They still go to elite universities. They go to the right churches. They belong to the right clubs, and they entertain in the correct way. Uh, Brooke Astor was recently uh, in the news um, uh, where there was some money scandal, but that's to be expected because these old families are what we call old money, and that old money is still very powerful. So the aristocratic families of New York are still here. You might never encounter them because they live in their own little world. They go to their own schools and they are members of dynasties. New dynasties are emerging all the time. The Trump dynasty, the Kushner um, oligarchs of New Jersey, very powerful dynasty in America. We see the Bush dynasty. Here again, every city has its aristocratic families that intermarry. That's me on the right when I was at a very gala um, Christmas banquet or once at one of the private clubs where I managed to get an invitation. So the aristocrats are still here. New people as they move to the city, the Chinese, the Hispanics, the Muslim population, Africans, they are also collecting money, gaining success, and hope to merge with the older aristocratic families of the Dutch, English, and German New York City elite. So I'm sure that as humans start more, more migrating and we start building space settlements on Mars, gradually there are going to be emerging elite who was the first family to, desert, to become famous on Mars and will have a Martian elite and a Martian equivalent of Fifth Avenue going to the right churches, intermarrying with the right families. And of course, not everybody remains part of the elite. In Europe, you can be a duke or a duchess, even if you don't have any money. But in New York, if you lose your money, well, then you lose your Fifth Avenue mansion and you retreat back into nothingness. And a new family will emerge to take your place. So that's a unique characteristic of the American dynastic families. You're never permanently there. You can always lose your position. And typical New York, there are no dukes and duchesses and princesses. Like Mrs. Astor, you will forever remain a Mr., a Miss, or a Mrs. So, Thank you very much for joining me in this exploration of the emergence of a, an American upper class, an American aristocracy. And we have everybody to thank, including Mrs. Carolyn Shemmerhorn Webster. Pastor, one of the great ladies of New York history. So this is Ronald Brown logging off. I hope you enjoyed the talk and getting to know Mrs. Astor a little bit better. And I wish you a very good day. Bye-bye.